So welcome to the uh, Human Anatomy and Physiology course. Uh, during this semester, we are going to talk about different uh, systems. Yeah, the muscular system, the skeletal system. We're also talking about the physiology. We're going to talk about how each one of these um, system interacts, and you will hear a lot about many names. How uh, yes, and num and uh, and there will be a lot of things. However. I know that many of you are interested in, in a healthcare profession. So although you will not remember maybe in detail all these things, one thing that definitely you will have to remember that you will be using all the time is um, aspects like the, the body planes. Yeah, there are some names and nomenclature that is very important that you remember. Yeah, and that you will use all, all your career. So so let's start and uh, let's start working on this wonderful uh, course of human anatomy and physiology. Okay, so we're going to start with the chapter number one, that is the organization of the human body. And in this chapter is divided in three main sections. In the beginning, we're going to talk about what is anatomy. Yeah, we're going to talk about what is the root of anatomy, the different type of anatomy that we find. Then we're going to go from uh, what is physiology, so similar questions, and how many type of physiology fields that are, yeah? So we're going, in both, we're going to go from a macro to a micro perspective. Finally, we're going to remember some of the things that you study in high school or in, in our university courses. And, um, and so in this part, there will be a lot of uh, other video lectures that will complement this area. And um, there will be also practice questions that I highly recommend you that you study. Okay, so let's start with what is anatomy. Okay, so at the end of the course, uh, I'm sure that right now you don't know all the names, yeah? You maybe, you don't know if I ask you what are all these names, you have no idea, you know that this is a brain. However, each one of these sections of the brain, you don't know. Maybe you know some of the muscles, but not all the muscles in the lab. You're going to learn a lot of this and with your textbook, you will go over that. Yeah, today I just want to tell you that anatomy, if you study the, the Greek root, it means to cut, to to break into part. Yeah, so uh, in uh, for example, through dissections. And with, with anatomy, we're trying to divide the body into different sections. Okay, so and why we divide it? To study it. So anatomy is the study of the body structures. So there are two main areas of anatomical study, and you can see it here in these two pictures. So here you have the macroscopic, yeah. So you can see all the all the muscles in your body interacting, you know, to kick the ball and to move it far away. And here, so you need your muscles in your abs, in your both legs, also in your torso. All of them are interacting uh, to be able to kick the ball. However, at the same time, you need to study anatomy. At the, at the micro at the microscopic level so here you have protein like actin and myosin interacting at the at the cellular level to be able to produce all this movement okay so i told you that there was an area called uh, the microscopic anatomy that is also called gross anatomy and that area is very important and it can be divided in two in three main uh, subfields one that is the surface anatomy that we will talk about that in a second in the following slide and the other two are uh, systemic anatomy and regional anatomy now the other area big area of anatomical study is the microscopic anatomy and has two subfields one that is the cytology and the histology and remember look they finish in this uh, ology you know like biology like all this and if you go to the greek yeah all this logic mean a study of yeah so here it will be a study of the cells and here is a study of the tissues okay and uh, this is maybe one example of how the roots in 
Greek will be very important for you to simplify it to understand many things. You don't need to remember everything. However, if you remember uh, a simple number of roots, uh, uh, in Greek roots, uh, in anatomy and physiology, you will be able to guess many of the functions and many of the locations of the different uh, tissues and body parts. And during the course, we will talk more about that. And there is a, a list of a, um, a, a list of uh, uh, roots that I think it will be very useful for you to remember. Okay, so now let's go and talk a little bit in more detail about this uh, microscopic anatomy, or also known as gross anatomy, and the three subfields that we talked in the previous slide. So in the first, uh, the first subfield is the the surface anatomy and is the easiest one to remember is the one that doesn't uh, that is the study of external anatomical features yeah that don't require any dissection so for example you can see your fingers your eyes your ears you don't need to do a dissection to see those things and so there are the external anatomical features okay so first one done now that we talk about the surface anatomy we're going to talk about the systemic anatomy. In this one, different uh, from the surface anatomy, we are going to go in the internal anatomical features. And here it's pretty simple. It's different, the different body systems. So here we have a different body system. Here, for example, the digestive system, the lymphatic system, the urinary, the respiratory, some of them that we will cover this semester, other ones that we will cover in the following semester. Okay, so we cover first the external, that is the surface anatomy. Now we talk about the systemic anatomy, that is the internal one that studied the body, uh, the body system. And finally, we have the regional anatomy that have this, uh, uh, that divide the body in a specific region. So for example, here we are not, we are not talking about eye in the head, one region we are not talking about the ears or the nose we're talking about this specific region we talk about the uh, the, uh, the torso the arms so very general regions okay so okay so we talk about three subfields of the microscopic anatomy surface anatomy systemic anatomy and, and regional anatomy now we're going to do the same thing with the microscopic anatomy so we're going to talk about two main uh, topics of a study, two areas of the microscopic anatomy that are the cytology and the histology. So in the cytology, as we said before, is the study of the structure and function of cells. So here you can see an example of all the different type of cells and all the different structures. So uh, this is very important for anatomy and physiology because as you will see in the lab and in the lecture components, for example, uh, tendons are very different from epithelia and they have different proteins and, and this is very important to understand when things are working and why some things are not working. Uh, in addition to cytology, now we have histology. Then in histology, we talk about the organization and details of uh, biological tissue. So in our words, cytology study cells, histology study tissues. And um, you will see that uh, we had different sections of the class and one of them we will focus about, uh, we will focus on each one of, of the tissues, yeah? And if you're interested in this topic later also, we are going to talk a little bit about development and we have a class in developmental biology that uh, cover that in more detail. Okay, so we'll talk about tissues like epithelia, we'll talk about tissues like the connective tissues, the bones, all these different tissues that are very important. Okay, an art subfield of anatomy is called pathological anatomy that is study the structural changes associated with the disease process. So here you have two pictures, fancy pictures that are called angiograms. And here you see two structures that look like trees. They are arteries. And uh, you have here, all of you have here about that. And here 
so these blood vessels here they have an arrow and I wonder you think what happened there so if there is blood going everywhere here what happened you know so there was an obstruction something very common that happened and when you have an obstruction there is no more blood so if there is no more blood there is a blood supply the tissues around it the cells that are uh, around this area, they are going to not have the nutrients and they're going to die. So we have to repair them. And here, this is an schematic of, of what uh, humans have created, a structure uh, that is able to repair and recover the blood flow. It's called a stent, yeah? So here I show you a damaged artery and here I, you saw a repair artery. And this picture, as I told you, is an angiogram that allows us to see these two arteries for the pre and the post stain repair of an obstructor, obstructed artery. So at this point, you should know what is anatomy, that is the study of the body structures, and that there are different subfields. So we have Two major subfields that is to study the macroscopic structures, yeah, and the other one that is to study the microscopic structures. Okay, so now that we finish studying what is anatomy, we're going to ask the same question, but with physiology. What is physiology? To study what is uh, physiology, uh, one that you see this schematic that is from Tukat from a kid's book that say how the body work. This is a simple way to explain kids what is a physiology because physiology is the study of how our body works and how it does it through the light of two fields that is physics and chemistry. So for example, in our circulatory system, uh, we all know that it's very important that it bring all the nutrients to our body and for example it bring the oxygen to each one of our cells and how it carry it because it has a specific structure specific protein yeah that you have here that is called here hemoglobin yeah that maybe you have here let's put hemoglobin yeah and this hemoglobin has a strong affinity yeah have a surface that in which the oxygen is going to attach very well yeah so so from studying the physics and the chemistry of this protein that is the hemoglobin we're able to understand how we're able to carry oxygen through all our body and in the same way we can do this we can ask questions like okay why bones are so strong and calcium plays a key role how tendons are so flexible how we in our brain have so many functions and we can transmit uh, transmit all these stimulus yeah and what is the uh, we all know that electrical so physics stimuli are very important in our body in particular in our brain so this is what some of the things that we are going to study during all the semester so remember physiology study how the uh, body works and just a cool fact that uh, maybe you never hear it is the root of uh, physiology so physio means origin uh, or nat nature of origin and, and uh, logy of course study so is the study of how the body star and interact and, and originate and why we study anatomy and physiology why we study physiology because we want to know not only the different parts of the body we want to know how they work so in case that they don't work we not only know how to identify it we not only know the structure but we know the mechanisms to repair it okay so i told you that uh, physiology has a greek root here if you know greek uh, you know, this means uh, physios means nature or origin, and physiology is the study of the body functions. Yeah, so how our body works. And I told you that it described from a chemistry and, and the chemistry and the physics behind of the different body functions, from how molecules behave in a cell 
to how systems of organs work together. And finally, I told you that, the, that this field is very important because it helps us to understand how a healthy person, yeah, all these functions work. And when somebody, when something is not working, we can uh, understand how to repair those functions. Now we are going to study the different areas of physiological study. Um, here we are going to highlight three. One that is the cellular physiology that you imagine that is more the cellular aspects, DNA, how the cells work, how these cells interact to each other. Uh, the other one that is the systemic physiology that in this case is how all these body components work. And finally, the pathophysiology that again it is a study when something is going wrong, how we fix it. So we're going to start with the cellular physiology and here you know this molecule that is very important and why I put it that because uh, in cellular physiology you need to understand all the biological activities they, that take place in a cell and that they keep it alive and of course you, the DNA will play a key role so you will need to have a transcription, translation, and of course replication. And uh, we are going to have a quick review about those key fundamental topics. One, there will be many questions, so you test your knowledge to know how much you remember. Uh, a part of cellular physiology is, of course, all the cellular organelles. So, for example, how uh, the body produces all the energy, what is the role of the mitochondria of doing all those things. And uh, in addition to that, we're going to cover intercellular communication. So for example, you need to know how the different cells interact to each other to produce a tissue, how the proteins produce, they attach to each other to multi-complex proteins. So yeah, cell adhesion complex, don't worry. I know maybe you never hear about them. We are going to cover them. And, and uh, there will be different video lectures so you can watch it in case that you have any doubt. Uh, how we study the different, uh, uh, all these different functions. Yeah, so we cannot do experiment in humans, but as the, we have a lot of similarity between animals, cells, plant cells, and, and humans. Yeah, and even at the cellular, the genetic level, we have a, a lot of similarities uh, with unicellular organisms. So this, the DNA molecule, we share a lot of enzymes, a lot of processes are, are highly conserved. So a good way to study all these functions is to use model organisms. So well, in the previous one, in the previous branch of physiology, we were focused on a cell. Here in the systemic physiology, we're focused uh, on the overall function of different, not all, different cells or different tissues or different organs, but the, the, the entire system, yeah, the interaction of all those things. And for example, similar happen with animals or with humans. Yeah, I don't know if you have a pet and you have to take it to the veterinary. My cats love to eat garbage. I don't know why. And sometimes we have to take it to the bed, yeah? And they don't go and study every single cell. They have to study what happened with the digestive system when they ate, I don't know, who knows all the things that they eat instead of the, the food that, do, that we buy it. Yeah, so uh, this approach is very important because uh, all the functions, the repairing the cell is also important, yeah? However, some of the problems will be good, uh, the solution, you need to study it from a systemic perspective. Okay, so what is uh, systemic physiology? Systemic physiology study specific organ systems and how they function, yeah? And I give you an example of, of my cat, but the same thing happened with humans. So uh, this the, uh, systemic physiology will study, for example, how the digestive system work and how the different roles of ingestion, digestion, absorption, and excretion, excretion. And so in the beginning, we talk about cellular physiology. Now we talk about systemic physiology, and now we're going to move to the third one. 
So now we are going to study the last subfield that is pathophysiology. So we study the intersection between pathology and physiology. And to study that, I show you this very weird mole um, uh, that you see there. I need to go to the dermatologist just from seeing it and check that everything is going well. And you can see all these irregular borders, all these gradients of color that are very weird. And, and what pathophysiology is a study, the disorder physiological process that can cause these kind of diseases, yeah? So here we can study, okay, what is happening with the cell division? What is happening with the function? Maybe UV light uh, create mutations there in, in, in the mole, and now this, the epithelial cells are not working properly, and these moles are, are behaving in a, in a weird way, yeah? So remember, uh, this field, the third field, the pathophysiology study the intersection between pathology and physiology. And in addition to that, is concerned about the disordering physiological process that can come from disease and injury. Okay, so we finished the three different areas of physiology that we are going to cover. Cellular physiology that focus at the cellular level. The second one, uh, systemic physiology that study physiology from a, a general perspective and uh, from a general perspective yes and the third one that is pathophysiology that focus more on the disease okay so now we're going to focus on the structure and the functions so finally we're going to study the principle of complementarity you can see this more in detail in your textbook but the idea is that to understand the structure you understand you need to under, understand the function and to understand the function uh, you need to understand the structure yeah so so in other words if you understand the structure it will be the anatomy yeah and if you understand the function it will be the physiology okay so for example if you have this soccer player if you want to know how he's going to run very fast and score a goal yeah so he's going to go you need to understand that he has bones that give them support that he has muscles that that it allowed them to be fast but he also have hinges here that are are that are joints yeah and two in bad cases so good cases knees working properly bones are good joints are good and however we can understand when problems appear yeah so what happened if we understand the structure the anatomy we are able to understand the function and how to repair it in case that something is not working so to summarize this the way in which something bones muscles joints are built so the anatomy the structure determines the way in which will work so it functions so for some reason bones have so many so much calcium while joints uh, and, and make them stronger yeah the bones while the joints they need to be more flexible and then and they have uh, different proteins that allow them to be more flexible so we finished the second section of the class now you know that anatomy study the body structure while physiology study the body functions and both have different uh, subfields some of them from a microscopic no ones from a microscopic and and also the that pathology is very important in both cases now we're going to cover the fundamental aspects of biology that you need to understand uh, the anatomy and physiology of this course so First thing that you need to remember is the level of a structural organization. Uh, so the order in which our bodies are formed, and we will study it in that way in, in this course of anatomy of physiology, and your book is organized in that way. So we will study it from a chemical level. Yeah, so we will talk about atoms and, and how these atoms have bonds that form molecules, like the molecule of DNA, then uh, we will move to the cells 
yeah and then we will move to tissues and uh, organs and systems okay and the uh, from a microscopic level the highest level will be the organismal level in in this diagram okay so in this slide they were shown from the the lowest level to the highest level of complexity and there will be video lectures that can help you to remember some of these topics in our cases you already studied this uh, in different biology courses so you can just go to the practice test and see if you need to remember or you need to go back to the textbook or to the video lecture to remember all this information okay so here i'm going to show you the level of organization uh, using a pyramid so i want that you remember this at the chemical level what are the elements yeah the elements different atoms that are most common in living organisms okay so that is a question that is very easy and you should know and if not in the video next video lecture we will cover it also what are the molecules that are more common in living organisms and in humans so yeah the molecules um have you heard about the word macromolecules okay what are the macromolecules yeah the biomolecules Okay, so we will cover those ones, but in case that you don't remember it, and we will talk about that. And I wonder if you think about the different type of cells. That is pretty easy. Now, what different type of cells do you think that exists? What different type of tissues? You can write it down in case that you know. The different organs, this is even easier. Different systems. Okay, so in case that you're gonna stop the video and try to answer those questions, or and i'm going to show you the the answer so here for example we're going to talk about that the the most important elements in our in living organisms are carbon hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen yeah, so they are the most common ones and we're going to talk about the uh, uh, about these topics and in in much more detail and we're going to talk about molecules like uh, we're going to talk about organic chemistry and in terms of macromolecules we will talk about carbohydrates lipids protein and of course water is so important it's a very important molecule for different living organisms uh, cells and during the class we will talk about different type of cells like cardiac cells muscle cells we'll talk about neurons and we'll talk about the function and how they the, the different proteins that they have. Uh, we are going to talk about different muscles at the organ level. Maybe you know the heart, you know the lungs. This is pretty easy. And at the cardiovascular level, uh, at the system level, for example, you have the cardiovascular. There are different systems, the skeletal system. Uh, you have the uh, respiratory system, circular story system. Okay, so this slide summarize all the things that we're going to study during the class and we will study again from the chemical level cell level tissue level and then we will focus on the systems and the organs now we're going to talk about the different uh, the six different basic life process here they talk about six in your textbook first one is metabolism responsiveness movement growth differentiation and finally reproduction and for the test remember that you need to be able to define each one of this process so let's start with metabolism so the first life process is metabolism and it can be defined as the collection or the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in uh, the body and there are two different types of different type of metabolism the first one that is called catabolism that refer to that the main idea is that it, it causes the decomposition and release of energy so here you see a complex molecule so imagine a complex sugar yeah so the idea is that when we catabolize that we turn that into small molecules and release energy yeah 
Opposite to that, we have the anabolism, that is the synthesis. Yeah, so while one is decomposition, the other one is synthesis. So here you have small molecules and you turn it into complex molecules. Yeah, this is how you store food. Yeah, so if you need to start something, uh, start some molecules in your body, you need to do it in an organized way so you can take all these glucose molecules and turn it into glycogen in your body that is a, is a collection of many sugars, uh, of many glucose molecules together. Um, but to do that, to store that, you need to invest some energy. Okay, so you require energy. So one, the catabolism is decomposition and, uh, and re uh, release energy. The anabolism is the opposite, it, the synthesis, and it requires energy. Now let's go to the second uh, property of life. Here in these two pictures, I wanted to show you two main components of the process of uh, responsiveness or irritability. And here you need to have a receptor, yeah? And here you need to find, have an effector. Yeah, so for example, okay, let's write effector, effector, yeah, so here, for example, let's imagine that there was a lot of sun. So this person, he was here, and uh, he need to have a receptor in the body that say, like, you know, you're getting burned, very careful, something has happened here. So there was an external stimuli that it was, uh, that it was creating a change in the body, and he need a receptor to be able to sense it. Then, uh, we also need effectors. So effector is the one that is in charge of the response. So for example, if you're running really fast because you're late for class, yeah, or you're scared because there is a question in the test that you didn't know, so your uh, heart rate, it, is start, it will start increasing, yeah? However, if you're going to sleep or you say, oh my God, this class is too boring, your, body, your heart rate, it will reduce. Um, yeah, your body doesn't need as much oxygen, so so your heart rate will change. So in other words, um, this uh, uh, property of, uh, of the uh, life property uh, that is called responsiveness is the ability to detect and respond to change in the environment, similar to changes in the uh, amount of UV light that we get, yeah, that it will produce different stimuli you will need to have two main components to have this responsiveness. One, that is the, to have a, a receptor of the stimuli, and the second one, that is to have an effector, that it will be the one that produces the response. And the, the receptor will detect the change, in this case, the UV light, uh, that it will be detected by the receptor in the skin, and the effector, uh, that it will be the change in the heart rate, that it will produce the response. The third life property of, that they show in your textbook is movement. And here you can see three pictures of movement and type of movement in your body. There are many more. Here they focus on, um, if you see, this kid is going to a dancing class, so she's going to move her entire body. Uh, also, in your, your system and your organs, if you imagine you're playing soccer or you're playing volleyball and you're jumping, so we need to prevent that some organs move while all the ones they do, they, they need to do it. So for example, your heart need to increase and, and reduce in size over time. I know that this is not a, a picture of a real heart, but it's a, a good, if you understand that this is hard, yeah? So we need to increase and reduce. So that, however, your brain doesn't have to move as much. So we will study in class all the different membranes that are around the brain, uh, the skull, and all these structures that allow that the brain have minimal damage if there is movement. So, for example, if you're in a car accident, that that uh, your brain has uh, uh, the lowest impact. Uh, so, first it was the entire body, then it was the organs, and now we're going to the smallest level of organization, or uh, in those three, these three pictures, that is will be the cell and. The cells in, our, in your body can move, so um, not only 
during development. During development, it's very common that some of them they move while their body, while the uh, that the body is forming. But also during development, uh, during adult life, there are cells that move. So, for example, to if you cut yourself, needs need to move to repair them. The immune cells are constantly moving, and uh, any cell of your body is able to move, or it has the genes that allow them to move. So what happened when cancer appear is that there are mutations and now those genes that are off to say don't move right now because you are not an immune cell, so you are an epithelial cell, you need to move. So those mutations appear and now the cells start performing other functions. So third function, third life property, movement, that can happen in the entire body, organs, or at the cell level. Okay, the four life property is a growth, and here you can see a picture of two human beings, and of course, baby very uh, small, and here you have an adult that is much bigger. And why? Because there was an increase in the in the sizes of the body, in the cells of the body, and also in the number of cells. Okay, so this is um, a, a way to very simplistic to explain growth, like the increase in both size uh, of the cells and also number of cells. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, growth, you can take cell biology that we covered that topic. And also in cancer biology, we talk about how tissues grow uh, and, and how they can become malignant when they, they don't have the proper uh, way to control their growth. Now we are going to move into differentiation. So differentiation, also known as specialization, and uh, this topic again, it will can be covered. We will cover in more detail in developmental biology in case that you're interested in taking that class. But the main idea is that here you have uh, an embryo, yeah, and here all the cells, if you see, they look very similar. However, during development all these embryonic stem cells, uh, they specialize. So in the beginning, they are unspecialized and, in, and, and they are not differentiated and they are primitive cells. And during development, they can change because there is a differential gene expression. Yeah, so some genes are expressed and some in, in your neurons, for example. Uh, this is the example uh, in this schematic well all our ones will be off yeah so for example here there will be no gene for the epithelial cells activated it will be gene for the nervous system for the neurons activated so in that way they can turn uh, into neurons and not into neuro into epithelial cells so there are pros and cons to differentiation so one of the main pros is that for example, these two examples, your heart and your brain have cells that are highly specialized and they are responsible of functions that are unique. Yeah, so very different function. One, in your brain, you are able to transmit signals, electrical signals and chemical signals, while in, uh, in, your, in your heart, you are able to pump blood to different parts of the body and is, is those two organs are unique yeah, and have unique uh, functions uh, uh, at the cellular level. However, there are also cons. Um, the main disadvantage is that as the cells uh, specialize, yeah, the tissues specialize, they lose the ability to respond to a stress. So for example, here in picture one and two, they are showing the two leading causes of death world death in our society. So first one it will be yes heart attacks yeah so let's see cardiovascular disease it will be a better heart attacks or cardiovascular disease and the second one more difficult here to know to guess what it is but of course there's cancer and again if you want to take, you want to know more about cancer, cancer biology, we will teach you that cancer is a collection of more than 150 diseases. So this is why it's so difficult to cure because you're not curing one disease, you're curing hundreds of diseases at the same time. 
uh, it's like when you talk about a call, you all said it's like a general term that collects a lot of these systems. So another disadvantage, another con of the process of differentiation, yeah, is the is that although some of them they can go back, yeah. So for example, this person had a problem in the bones, um, it, it had a fracture, so we need to repair it. So what we do, we go back in development, and for example, these cells called osteocytes, they go back and they differentiate during growth and they are able to repair and then go back and re-specialize yeah so they go back repair the wound and they specialize back however this property of um, differentiation and de differentiation can in some cases can be detrimental yeah so for example neoplasm is the formation of, of abnormal growth yeah uh, and in mammary gland is one of the causes of that the breast cells uh, can become a, a cancerous epithelium. So although the differentiation uh, is a, it could be, it could be useful in many cases, it can also have some potential to uh, have a bad side effects. And this is not the only case. So mammary glands are not the only case on which this diff the differentiation can be a problem. Uh, actually, cancer can be defined as a wound that it didn't heal properly. So every time that you have an injury, there is if it's constant repair, there is a constant repair. Uh, there is a, an increase in cancer risk. Yeah. So why? Because uh, tissues have to go through mitosis and repair cell and kill the cells that are partially damaged and uh, sometimes the more times that this happens the more times that you can accumulate a mutation yeah so the process of the differentiation uh, has positive and also negative effects and i want to connect that with the pro with the six uh, life property that is the process of reproduction if you watch this video it's, it's not this video this picture uh, you can see a very cute feed from a baby yeah and um, here, uh, when we talk about reproduction, we know that reproduction produce uh, new cells. And how it does it? There are two modes of reproduction that we will talk in this class. There are many more that we will talk in uh, in developmental biology. But here, since high school and in, in some introductory classes here, you study that at the cellular level or Mitosis is very important and um, it is in charge of growth and growth and repair, while meiosis is more important at the organismal level because it's the one that perpetuates uh, the species. Okay, so reproduction uh, is the life, the last life property, and remember there are two uh, main uh, types of cell division that we will study in, in a little bit of detail later in, in this course. So we finished the six life and uh, the six properties of life. Now we're going to move to one of the key um, concepts of this course that is homeostasis. If you have never heard about homeostasis, I wonder if you remember this figure. This represent the internal balance of your body, yeah, the internal uh, microenvironment of your body. So it needs to be the proper amount of water, the proper amount of ions, the proper the correct temperature, and the body has different mechanisms to regulate this um, uh, this uh, this process. Yeah. So homeostasis can be defined as uh, uh, the internal balance of of, of your body. Yeah. So while the external environment can change a lot. The temperature can change during the day, so it can get hot, cold, then a little bit it can rain. Your body needs to regulate the correct temperature during the day, and the same thing happens with uh, with different molecules of, of your body. So, just uh, as usually, we go to the Greek roots, and homeo means same, and stasis means uh, to keep it still. So again. To, is the maintenance of uh, of the internal environment in your body, and this will be one of the essential 
concepts, yeah, the homeostatic balance is one of the essential concepts in this course, and we will talk about that uh, during different sections of the course. The definition here, you can find it, is the maintenance of body internal environment and as we said there should be a balance and we will talk about the that this is a dynamic process yeah that there are different mechanisms and of course there is a, a specific physiological limits if we go to 100 degrees we will die yeah and your body is not going to be able to regulate it yeah if you run out of uh, if you don't drink water for several days uh, you will end up dying. So, although the homeostasis is a very important process and there are many mechanisms to maintain the internal environment, there are some limits. And your body, in order to be here happy, you to have a happy face, uh, you need to uh, have three, at least three main characteristics, yeah? To have uh, this homeostatic balance. So if you want to have a happy face, First thing that you need to do is you have to have an optimal concentration of nutrients, ions, water, and different gases. Yeah. Uh, also, you need to have the optimal temperature. Yeah. And this optimal temperature, remember that your proteins, yeah, and your body, so many of them are enzymes. So, and those enzymes are regulating your metabolism. So, if your temperature is the temperature is too high. Uh, the the proteins are going to not work properly, so there will be no metabolism. And generally, higher temperature uh, it will be a it will require, it will be related to a higher metabolism, where lower temperatures will be a lower metabolism or a slower metabolism. Okay, and third check mark to have a happy face and that your body is saying I am in a perfect homeostatic balance is to have an optimal intracellular and extracellular fluid volume. Yeah? So the amount of water, the amount of ions that they should be in the cells is, is very important. So the amount of sodium, the amount of potassium is very important. This is why you have pumps and, and we will talk more though about that in, in the following classes to review them to tell you Okay, do you remember these ion pumps? That they are very important, and why? Because later, when we study the uh, the action potential of the nervous system, so all electrical impulses appear in your body, we need to have this optimal intracellular and extracellular uh, contents. Yeah. Now we are going to talk about stressors that affect the homeostasis and they, they will create an imbalance. They could be two types. They could be some stressors that they could be external. Yeah. So, for example, if this too hot the sun is creating and you are outside, so you will start losing water. This could be a stressor. You can get dehydrated. Internal, uh, for example, if you develop a mutation, you you accumulate mutations that affect your mitosis or that so a protein is not working very well. So they could be both external and internal stressors that it, they can lead to an imbalance in, in, in the homeostasis process. So, so remember, a stressor can be defined as an external or internal stimulus that cause a change and will lead to a homeostatic balance. Uh, or in this case, that create a homeostatic imbalance that affect uh, bodily function. And there are two types, yeah? So the duration of the stress can be is very important. It could be temporary or it could be a prolonged stress and depending on that, the consequences can be very different. So here, I don't know if imagine that this cat is very stressed for a second. So the other cat here goes and in a very cute way, give them some massage. So there will be minimal problems, the other cat will relax, um, and it could be quickly solved. Less cute than that is what happened to this finger. Hopefully this never happened to you, that it happened to me a few times, that uh, you hit your, your finger or your toes and, and exactly in the nail, in the root of the nail, and you have this patch of blood, and you can see that it takes 
uh, months until until the cloud disappear, and and um, but the structure uh, it, it definitely wouldn't and it will be normal. However, if instead of being temporary, we have this severe, there's a permanent damage. They could lead to a chronic disorder or it could lead also to a possible death. So one key process is homeostasis and to preserve homeostasis, the body uh, work in different ways. And if it's not able to do it, it can lead to or diseases or uh, even death. Now I'm going to show you a schematic from your textbook that show what happened when you have a disturbance in the homeostasis and um, here they talk about two main concepts in the previous one i told you about the duration here they also talk about the the severity the magnitude of the events of the imbalance so if you have uh, that um, an imbalance that is very small yeah, a change in the homeostasis that is very small is not going to be abnormal it will just stay close to the set point value so things is, are going fine however if you go to a normal point it's a more dramatic more pronounced in time or or in um, in severity in the magnitude you can go to uh, you can uh, this can lead to a disease or if you go to a much more prolonged or more uh, a higher magnitude this can lead this imbalance can lead to to death Okay, so remember a homeotic imbalance occurs when a specific body structure or function cannot require, return to the normal set points and it cannot go to the green area and it can be due depending on the duration and the severity the imbalance will have different outcomes that it can go from no effect to a disease or in the most extreme of the cases it could be death. So now we're going to talk about how to regulate homeostasis, how the body controls homeostasis. And one of the ways, there are multiple mechanisms. One of them is to create these feedback loops that have four components. In the beginning, you have a stimuli, yeah, different stimulus that they will lead to an imbalance. So for example, you're getting dehydrated, so you're losing water and you're losing the correct uh, uh, amount of ions that they should be inside of yourself. So, what happens is that you have receptors, in this case they will be proteins that are sensing all the time, that are saying, making sure that the homeostasis is preserved. And this will be the second component. And the third component, they will be a control center, yeah, that is says, so they receive a signal that says, like, okay, there is a problem, in this case, for example, it could be the nucleus, yeah, there is a signal sent to the nucleus and say, like, we need to activate to let more water get inside of the of in, in, in the cells we need to get the right amount of ions and, and remove the the sodium ion outside of the cell and so they send a signal so you have then the for a component that is an effector and this will allow that the process of phenocytosis the aquaporins all these proteins that allow cells to get inside of the cell and the ion pump that allow the the right and the correct ions to get inside of the cell uh, to, uh, to to start working again. And in that way, you go back to a correct balance inside of the cells. So what I told you, I told you in this slide that homeostasis is maintained using feedback systems, also known as feedback loop. And I show you that there were four main components. A feedback loop is, a, or a feedback system, it's a cycle of events which constantly monitors many body functions, yeah, uh, and they could be different variables, and uh, they report the status of each variable back to a control center for the analysis and response, and uh, <clears throat> it's used by both the nervous and the endocrine system to control many body functions. So I show you an example. Uh, at the cellular level, but in this course, we will talk about uh, these two the nervous, the central nervous system, the autonomous nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and we will talk also about the endocrine nervous system, so all the hormones that are also involved 
in, in controlling uh, this uh, process of homeostasis. Now we're going to talk about, we're going to break into more uh, detail, we're going to talk in more detail about these feedback loops in the following slide, and I will show you uh, a, a, a diagram found in your textbook. So here is the figure that you find in your textbook, is the same idea, just have extra steps, I just color coded for you. So in the beginning you have a stimulus, and this stimulus is going to disrupt the process of homeostasis, uh, increasing or decreasing a, a control condition. I gave you an example of the water and the salt in your body, it could be also, um, <clears throat> it could be also the temperature of your body. Maybe there's a virus, a bacteria that is, 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 is and you find that the body of your temperature is starting increasing. Yeah. The second, uh, this control condition is start changing, and is uh, so how do you know that it's changing? Because it's constantly monitored by a receptor, uh, and this receptor will send a nerve impulse or chemical signals. Chemical signals generally are in terms of uh, at the cellular level or using hormones and nerve impulses uh, are uh, more uh, systemic, well, more than cellular, the cellular process. Uh, then he will be sent to a control center. Yeah, so this will be a, an input signal into the control center. And, uh, and then the control center will send an output signal that it is uh, receive the input and provide nerve impulse or chemical signals. So, for example, if there is a nail and you are or and and you touch the nail or a cacti or the oven was on and you put your hand there, so your body quickly send a signal and say uh, you are burning or you uh, move your hand from there, yeah. And then so you will have an effector and that it will lead um, it will lead to a change, a response to come back to a, a control condition. And this will allow the cell, the, the entire body, to return to homeostasis. So uh, again, it's the same idea here. They just give you more detail. So remember, there are in your textbook. They they want that you remember that there are one important component of the feedback loop is the, the presence of receptors that are monitoring a control condition uh, or a variable and they detect the stimulus and act as a sensor and they send inputs or reports to the control center. They also want that you remember the, uh, the, the importance of this second component that is the control set, uh, center that set optimum range, a set point for each body function. So for example, uh, the body temperature, yeah. So it doesn't need to be 36, 37 all the time, but if it goes uh, lower than uh, 30, 34, if you go higher than 42, we are, we, the, the things can get dangerous. So um, it allows to determine the next action. So it received the input from the receptor and it will send it to the, it will send a signal to the factors. And the last component that your textbook one that you remember is that there are effectors that, uh, uh, the idea that they receive the information from here, from the control center, and they produce a response, as you can see here, that allows the, the, the existence of a feedback and that everything goes back to normal. Okay, so remember, uh, this is a, a feedback loop, and I show you this from a very general perspective. Later during the course, we will give uh, names to the stimulus, to the receptor, uh, and to the factors, okay? But right now, I want that you just know the basics of this. So we already talked about homeostasis, and you know that it's a balance in your body, and we talked that it's very important, and uh, there are different ways to control it, different mechanisms, and one that is very important is the uh, feedback systems. So now we're going to move into the different type of feedback systems yeah, and the different ways to control the homeostasis. So in this slide I'm going to show you two. That one is the negative feedback 
and the other one is the positive feedback the negative is the most common type while the positive you find it in much less examples so uh, when we talk about negative feedback we talk about a, a process of inhibition so for example let's think about in your social life and your work or your study so if you're all the time study uh, yeah you will not see a lot of your friends yeah you're working all the time you're studying all the time so you don't see a lot of your friends so your social life will be lower and your work you will be very productive but there will be a point that you will be too tired and you say i need to do something different i'm not being productive so then you say you know it's the weekend I'm going to go and go out and meet some people, yeah, and talk to some of my friends. So your social life will increase and your work will be less productive. However, if you did this for a long time, you say, oh, I'm failing, I'm failing the class. I need to go on and look for a balance. Yeah, so this is a negative feedback, yeah, that when you have too much of one thing, you need to control it, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the positive feedback is more a domino effect so one reaction will lead to uh, uh, to unleash a series of reactions okay so there are two types of feedbacks negative and positive one that is common and the other one that happens less frequent now i'm going to tell you in the following slides more examples about the negative and the positive feedback now I'm going to show you an, an example of a negative feedback loop and this in this case is the thermal regulation of your body. So here you see a person that is in the right body temperature, not too hot, not too cold, but you know this person lived in Winnipeg. So of course there will be a point when the temperature reduces so your body temperature will decrease. So what the body does, the body need to have a plan of action and a plan of action to increase the temperature of the body for example it can be shivering yeah? so this person is start moving um, and in that way the body start warming up yeah every time that you move if you work out the muscles start uh, releasing energy and it's start increasing the temperature okay so it goes back into normal into a the appropriate temperature but again is when effect so now is summer and summers are getting hotter and hotter so now your body temperature increase or the, this guy body temperature increase so here you can see this gross picture that is very good because it, sh it shows very clear what is happening now the body need to have a cooling mechanism to reduce the temperature so the person start sweating here and in that way it reduces the, the temperature and it goes back to the proper temperature so if you see this was more like a pendulum yeah yeah so when it goes too much to one side then it has to come back and then you go to the other side so it, it has to come back okay so this pendulum is a way in which you can regulate the temperature so what i show you here is that a negative feedback is a response that your body has that allows to reverse the original stimulus. It was or too hot or too cold, and in both cases, it returned the body toward the set point to the orange guy that is not too hot or not too cold. And uh, it allowed to keep the body function in balance, yeah? So it allowed to, to remain at the right temperature. And as I said uh, to you, it, it is, it's like a pendulum effect. If, if you go too much to one side, it will come back to the other side until it, it, it achieves the proper uh, state, in this case, the correct thermal regulation. Okay, so now that we talk about the negative feedback, let's talk about the opposite, about the positive feedback. Okay, now we're going to move into the opposite example, that is the positive feedback loop. And in this case, it will be childbirth. So here it's pretty cool because I can show you some of the different components that we talked before. So, for example, we are going to talk about receptors. We're going to talk about the brain that is the, the control. 
and here you, you will, will see a response. So all the different steps that we described before, you will see it in this example. So here we have a baby that it has been there for the right amount of time, has the right size. So the body said, okay, it's time for the baby to uh, leave the body of the woman and start living outside. So what happened is that the body, instead of have this pendulum mechanism now is going to have a domino effect. So it will, will the, the muscles of the, of the woman are relaxed in this point. Now to, uh, for the baby to, to give birth to the baby, it need to contract and contract and contract until the baby is delivered. So instead of being from relaxation to contraction, relaxation to contraction, what we are going to have is contraction and a higher contraction and a stronger contraction until the baby is delivered. And how is that? So in the beginning, the baby take up uh, of all the space of the uterus and this create, this affect a receptor, in this case, a straight receptor that are activated in the uterus. And this produces a, a positive feedback that it will go to a, a receptor center, that in this case is the brain, that it will release a response that is the release of a signal that is the oxytocin. So this hormone is going to be sent uh, to the uterus uh, and it will cause the muscles to contract. And it's, instead of stopping there, this will create a positive feedback that it will continue happening and it will have, it will create a more contractions that they will be closer and they will be stronger until the baby is delivered. So here I just showed you an example of not a pendulum, yeah, not a negative, I show you an example of a domino effect in which the response, yeah, the activated stretch receptors, uh, instead of uh, instead of turning off the signal, they increase it, yeah. From the original stimulus and allow the 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 this this response to the body to move further from the set point. Yeah, so the woman it didn't went to relaxation and contraction, rotation and contraction. It went to contraction, a little bit of relaxation, the very even stronger contraction, to a little bit of relaxation to even a stronger contraction. Yeah. Um, this is a cascade of events um, that is uh, it produce a domino effect. Um, uh, remember this positive feedback always have a turn off response. So, for example, if you give special medication to uh, for a woman when they are, if the baby is not ready, they they are able to stop the contraction. Yeah, if they need the baby need to stop. You, uh, in some cases, this can be a scam. Okay, so with this, we finish uh, this class. Now, we I'm going to summarize the three key topics of this class. So, three key topics that we talked today. What is anatomy? So, you should know that anatomy is the study of the body structure. Um, I told you that there are different branches, different subfields. So you can say that from a microscopic or from a microscopic perspective and I give you some subfields and these are some examples of those. I also told you what is physiology that while anatomy focuses on the body structure, the study of the body function, in physiology you study the, the functions of, of, the, of the body how from a chemical and physical perspective. So while this uh, study the different components of the body, this study the different function of the of these body components. So they they to understand one is is very important to understand the other one. And in the same way, I show you that there are different subfields, like uh, this one that that are appear in the figure. And finally, I told you, I used to remind you some key concepts in biology. And from those one, maybe one that it was new, it was this of homeostasis. Um, I told you that feedback loops are very important and I give you two examples, one that they were positive and negative. So hopefully everything was clear. If not, 
please ask me as many questions as you have and in your textbook there is a lot of information that you can help you to understand this better and, and there's a, a practice test in case that, uh, that you are ready, you feel ready to start not testing your knowledge before the quiz or before the, 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 the test. Um, uh, if you have any question, again, just let me know. Have a good day and bye.